for the last 17 years of those, we've been benefiting from the support we get from WCN of many of you. So thank you, and this is a celebration for your dedication to our work. And I want to share some, some ideas about the future we see for Ethiopian wolves and how you can help us with that. Um, the first thing I want to do is just to share a normal day in our life in the field, uh, which is uh, also a reminder for me for that, that I love and enjoy so much. So we'll be out um, very early in the morning, and we're going to uh, um, very soon encounter the wolves that will be curled up in the open, having spent uh, the, the night there. And after some greetings, they will take off and engage in a, 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 a patrol of the territories just to make sure that they can uh, uh, keep control on the best real estate and keep some of the neighboring competitors at bay. Some of them will quickly return to their den um, to uh, support the, the litter of the main breeding, of the breeding female that is just tending to one of the pups. And there will be some of the other adults in packs as large as 19 uh, animals that will uh, babysit and bring food to the pups and look after them as if they were their own. And in doing that, securing the future of that pack. Um, once the job is done, then it's time to go out for food. And you're better off doing that on your own. And if you're fortunate enough, you're going to catch a jam or rat, which is a juicy favorite food. And uh, at uh, two pounds in weight, it's uh, going to provide enough food for the day. We are celebrating the topic of endemism and how these animals that are found nowhere else but in a particular country or region require special conservation needs and pose special challenges. And those uh, black uh, um, um, silhouettes in the map of Ethiopia, um, uh, 10,000 years ago we, represent, we have represented glaciers, but today are the last uh, strongholds of the Afro-Alpine ecosystem where the wolves make their home. And they are not alone. They share these uh, Afro-Alpine habitats, about 10,000 meters, uh, sorry, 10,000 feet, with people, the livestock, and the dogs. And with that uh, comes the most immediate threat uh, to the wolves. Uh, dogs tend to compete with the wolves for food. They can be aggressive and chase them away. And in some cases, they might even hybridize with the wolves. But, and, and you could see there is a wolf keeping watch at the back. Um, uh, but the main concern is that these wolves bring uh, disease into the system and these uh, rabies and canine distemper get transmitted to the wolves. And it was in the 80s, and that's a, a, a younger version of me um, working in Bale Mountains in 19, from 1987, where the first outbreak of rabies took place and where we realized the threat we were facing. Um, I'm celebrating the passing of time and how things change. Um, in the, in the mid-90s, uh, uh, Jorge Lina joined me in Ethiopia. Our daughter Pampa was born as an early millennial child. And uh, 10 days ago, she uh, left the house and went to university. So <laughs> things do change, but other things stay the same. And from a very small team, it was a team of two in the early days, uh, now there's more than 60 people working for the project. Uh, this is, uh, dates back a few years. Uh, uh, nowadays, it's, it's uh, less likely that we are uh, able to come all together because our team works across six different sites in Ethiopia. But some people here are gathering during a, a, a management training course that we ran recently represent some of our most senior staff that started working with us so many years ago and uh, they're acquiring increasing responsibilities with the project. As you can see, uh, we're working across those six populations and we have offices in several places. And this is an example of some of the work we are doing to address uh, the, the challenges brought about by disease. Um, we, are, uh, we can see here people preparing oral baits that we're going to uh, deliver to the wolves to, um, uh, to protect them from, from rabies. And you can see how we track using camera traps uh, the wolves coming to, to the baits and picking up those baits and self-vaccinating themselves. 
Time passes and things change, but other things stay the same. And this is the same, very same community, or one of the same communities I started working with in the 80s. And, and it's through that long-term view to conservation that you can start stealing some change and en engendering the trust uh, for the work we do uh, that brings hopes for the future. And that future can be secure only if we deliver protection uh, to uh, the functioning system so we can deliver a fully protecting ecosystem that is good for wildlife but also for the people that lives next to wildlife. And I want to introduce you a very special friend of mine from the RC Mountains, uh, Dr. Girma Shete. Please come over. Girma, Girma and Jorgelina have been responsible for the uh, biodiversity friendly futures and I wanted to share a picture of Girma looking very smart when he secured his PhD from Leiden University in the Netherlands. Thank you very much, Thank you. Girma. <laughs> and please, Jorgelina, uh, take over from here and tell us a little bit more about biodiversity friendly futures. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, I want to continue with that line and to say that with Girma, we travel everywhere to every mountain in Ethiopia, and we visited every population of Ethiopian wolves and also the places where the, the Ethiopian wolves were before and they are not anymore. And we learn many things with our travels and that inspire our biodiversity-friendly future program. We've seen agriculture encroaching, and as agriculture grows up and up the mountain, the wolves are trapped in tiny islands and isolated from each other. And in the recent years, we've seen many new roads crossing the habitat with all the impacts that we know roads have on the habitat and on the animals. But we've also seen uh, how people and wolves can coexist, or sometimes that coexisting is a bit more complicated, and in this place that we visited is the Mount Choke. This is where the Blue Nile uh, starts, the Blue Nile River that drains into the, the Nile. And this is a swamp that's been overgrazed, and the tussocks are dead, and this swamp is not going to retain the water a uh, longer time like before. We also see people collecting firewood and for, uh, collecting that they need for cooking, for lighting, to heating up because that's the only source uh, of energy that they are there and the, this uh, firewood comes from where the wolves live. And we also see people in this case going to the market transporting a, a grass that is very valuable. This is called wasa. It's a type of a stuka grass and it's a grass that is good for touching, to make ropes and as fodder. And uh, later on we will see how this Wasa, which I call the gold of the Afro-Alpine, can have a role in conservation. So communities need these areas, and the wolves need these areas. So our biodiversity-friendly future is a way to support livelihoods that are compatible with conservation, and maybe that also bring alternative incomes for these people. So one of our first projects is the one we call Highland Honey, so the honey from the highlands is very, very good. It has a fantastic taste and, and aroma. And in this photo, we see how we were delivering modern beehives to the farmers. The farmers prefer this type of beehive and they receive training. And I'm happy to say that it's this year, uh, around 100 families uh, had uh, um, bees producing honey and they collected more than 600 kilograms. And these beehives are located close to the Erika forest. These are the only trees up in the mountains. And this is where the honey comes and why the honey is so special. So the interesting thing is that the honey producers, now they organize themselves to protect these areas of Erika that before were being cut. And th these Erika forests are disappearing from many places. Sometimes they are also burned to open up for agriculture. And other of our projects benefits women in particular. Women in the highlands are the ones that spend more time collecting firewood, are the ones that make all the cooking, maybe not very different to here, I don't know. 
uh, with open fires and a lot of uh, smoke. So we have al already eight cooperatives made of women. They are, we help them trained to build fuel-saving stoves. These fuel-saving stoves uh, need around half of the firewood, and also they produce a lot less of the smoke inside the houses. And we help them to create a market for these uh, fuel-saving stoves. And here, for example, we are demonstrating how they, how they work in a local market. And we also go to the schools and with the children, and we make demonstrations and use leaflets. And we work with many, many um, schools that are very, very high up in the mountains, very remote places. Another activity is actually planting wasa, if you remember the African gold. Um, so in this case, uh, the farmers, they plant wasa in their homestead, or maybe in the agriculture fields next to the Ethiopian wolves. And this year, 75 families harvested wasa for the first time. Three years passed since they planted them. And that's a very important income for the households. This is all a wonderful Wasa grassland, and this photo is from a new national park. In these areas, uh, in this area in particular, 14 communities, they decided to start managing the wasa like they do in a traditional system, which also implies moving the livestock away from the mountains. So this is how this habitat was recovered, just with a traditional form of use, are also by the communities organizing themselves. And uh, we also worked with the community guards. The community guards are members of those communities that are in charge of patrolling and uh, checking that you know, nobody is uh, harvesting uh, the wasa outside the, the accepted times. We help them, train them to monitor wildlife, and they are very, actually very good monitors. They are very motivated. And now they will become scouts in this protected area that also has a form of co-management. And we were very, uh, our contribution was important in making the national park to realize that these forms of, natural forms of management are, you know, are proper conservation tools. So we are very proud of that, actually. So I want to finish just saying, so what is our vision for the future of Ethiopian wolves? And the first thing to say is that if we protect this Afro-alpine, it won't be only for the people or the wolves. There are many fantastic species that live here, and only in Ethiopia, so actually many other endemics that is a topic of our conversation, and that can be the gelada baboon, the mountainiala, the fantastic rodents that the Ethiopian wolf eats, and many, many more plants and, that are beautiful. And we can do that by working with the communities. So our biodiversity-friendly future has been a fantastic uh, approach for us, for EWCP, to move into protecting the habitat and finding long-lasting solutions to these problems that are not unique to Ethiopia. Probably you will hear similar situations from all the other conservationists talking to you here in the expo. So what about the problem of the diseases? It's, not, it's also a problem for people. So our One Health project is an integrated uh, approach to control diseases. It includes capacity building and awareness and vaccinating the domestic dogs that bring the disease and vaccinating the wolves. And as Claudio said earlier on, we are now starting an oral vaccination of Ethiopian wolves that will cover the whole country. And it took many years to get to that point, so we are very happy about that. And planting wasa might be the key to restore the habitat for the wolves. So we want to scale up, and we will try to do this in the places where it's most needed. And in the places where the wolves are gone, we want to bring the wolves back. And that is a long-term vision, but it's getting closer all the time. And for that, we may uh, need to understand the Afro-Alpine ecosystem as a whole with all these components. And we are developing sophisticated models with some scientists that are experts in rewilding. And so we can answer questions like, how is going to change the system if we introduce an Ethiopian wolf? So we are really excited about the future. And we want to say thank you because many of you here have helped us to get where we are now. 
uh, in the name of mine and Claudia and my whole team, I want to say thank you and to invite you to continue with us because I think there is an exciting future for the Ethiopian Wars. Thanks.